it was time for a woman to make a choice between telling the truth and dreading the mouth of fellow women villagers. It was a time for a woman to swallow her pride and swallow her shame and recall the false statements she had made concerning a fellow woman in her village. It was time for a particular decision that she didn't know was so important in her life to be made. And the woman asked her again, are you sure of what you're saying? And for the hundredth time, she said yes. And she went ahead to say, if I am lying, may I die from this pregnancy? A lot of people that knew my mother knew that even though this woman had sworn from her pregnancy that she was still lying against my mom. But when she went to the extent of swearing with her pregnancy, everybody shut up. There were certain groups of people, a particular group went home in doubt and said, if somebody can go to the extent of swearing with her pregnancy, maybe she's telling the truth. Some people went home and knew that this woman was lying. Some people went home hoping that God didn't hear her statement because she was wearing with her pregnancy. And she said, if I am lying, may I die from this pregnancy. I don't know if she thought that her pregnancy would never come to time. My mom cried and said, Really, you can lie to this extent and swear with your pregnancy? But that was not the time that my mom cried the most. She cried the most when she heard that this woman was in labor and died. She died and the baby died. I don't really know what happened to their father, the husband of that woman. But this woman lost her life like Judas. Believe me, there are some spiritual powers that work when you say something. <coughs> but that was not the aspect that really caught me into the action. The aspect that caught me into the action is that my mother took it as a responsibility to make sure that each time her children came to her house, they were well fed. Because these two children that she left were now begging food from one family to another. Each time you saw them in your family, you knew that they came for food. So, if the food wasn't ready, don't worry because they will wait. And they will wait and they will eat and after eating they will go. The only reason why my mother did not take them in was because the small boy, as small as he was, was already a notorious thief. Because of what has happened, he was pushed to the world too early. Left to fend for himself and people who had the mind of taking this 
boy or the people who had the mind of taking the girl, they were always suffering from his pilfering. He was stealing from here and there. It was too much. But the aspect that God made it was that my mother made sure that each time she had the opportunity, she would give them enough food to eat and she would pack food for them to go home with. To make sure that they will have at least some for a while before going out to bed. Stomaching nonsense as a Christian means that you have to have the mind of Christ. You have to have the mind of no revenge because the Bible says vengeance is mine. My mother cried so much when she heard that the woman died from her pregnancy for no cause. For no cause. Because it was a smooth pregnancy. She shouldn't have died. She just died and the baby died. And everybody remembered what she said. And the question is why would you have sworn with your life when you knew that you were lying? You think the devil is not listening? Stomaching nonsense means that when you are hurt, you don't seek for revenge. You have the mind of Christ and you do everything you can that is within your power to do what Jesus would have done if he was the victim. The Bible says, Be ye therefore perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect. Christianity is not an easy road. If it's an easy road for you, you are not yet growing. If you are growing and you are trying to get to heights in your Christian life, you will realize that you have to go to the point of stomaching nonsense in order to really be perfect. I was in the orthopedic world many years ago when I was in school of nursing. Prior to that, when I enrolled into the school, I have heard that some people did not finish school of nursing. And I started asking why. I discovered that some people didn't finish because they failed and failed. I knew that was not going to be my problem because I knew I would pass. And I asked about why other people didn't finish. And I understood that some people did not finish because of bad behavior. And I said, I know I'm a sinner, but I, I don't think I have any behavior that will keep me from graduating. Little did I know that the devil was planning for me not to finish. And so towards the end, of my program. On this day, I did feel very clear in my mind, like yesterday, I was accused of stealing hospital equipment to start my own practice when I graduate. You think it's a joke? It wasn't a joke at all, because my graduation was on the line. I wasn't going to graduate. And all these things happened in one day. And that decision was going to be made in one day. Because somebody has confidently accused me of stealing forceps. Forceps. Forceps, nurses. Forceps. Forceps. I'm talking about forceps. I'm talking about forceps because when I was in school, I had money. And I can say it, and people who were in the dormitory with me knew that I had money. Because my father pumped me with enough pocket money so that I wouldn't misbehave. But that's not why I didn't misbehave. 
I didn't misbehave because I had the spirit of God in me. But I had money. So I could actually buy so many fossils for the hospital if they in their son. I had money. But I was accused of stealing forceps. Simply because people have been stealing forceps. And in the skeletal world this particular day, I was accused because I dressed a wound and my packet was not complete from the autoclave. And when I received the packet, I didn't know what has been happening in the teaching hospital. So I opened the package, and those of you who trained from Nigeria knew that even if you open a, 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 a dressing packet, even if it's not complete, you know how to walk your way around. I know what to do. So I did what I was supposed to do, still maintain my sterile field, and dress the wound, and seal the packet, and returned. And then they say, who dressed this wound? The packet is not complete. I said, that's exactly how I saw the packet. They say, no, you stole the faucet. And my name went round. From one department, this was happening like a virus. From one department to another, everybody was saying, who is, who is, uh, uh, Jane, oh, when I, who, they were just, they were reporting me from one authority, they started researching, they said, and everybody said, no, every packet that was sent was complete. She stole it. And I wasn't going to finish. And God had to do something that same day before my shift finished, or I would not graduate. Because In the skeletal world, uh, we made one like we had um, the places we kept uh, urinals, we called them number one. <laughs> and the places we kept bed pans, we called them number two. I it got to the point, I think I had to go to either the number one or number two place because I, I didn't know, I couldn't leave the world. The unit, we call it ward back home because maybe I'm going to hide it or bring it from where I kept it. So I was con kind of confined because every eye was on me to know what my next fashion would be. So I had to be inside the unit. So I went to so either the number one or number two place. I missed bed pants. And I say, God. This is the time, and it has to be now, to prove that I did not steal this person. Lord, remember my father at all. Remember the news that he will be told why I didn't graduate. I was crying. I said, God, if you don't do something before the end of this shift today, I am doomed because I won't graduate. I'm a thief. I cried. I prayed. But it was a short prayer. But that is one of the prayers that I pray that God decided to stand up. Because the equation was that every packet that came from the autoclave department was complete. And so any packet that was returned incomplete the nurses must have stolen the forceps. And those of you that know the skeletal world know that our business here is wound dress. So everybody is dressing wound. That is the main thing. Because it's mostly people from road traffic accidents. And I pray. The 
They stopped me from dressing any more wounds so that I don't see more. I sat down and I was going through what I cannot express in my life. I was thinking about the years I have spent. I was thinking about how I'll be terminated. I was thinking about how I'll be accused for something I didn't do. I was, my mind was racing and I was saying, God, you have to do something for me for the sake of my father. Meanwhile, there were calls, landline, the teaching hospital. Okay, we're calling my father. What's going on? We are doing the investigation. I was making statements. And the shift was going on. But I trusted God so much because there was nothing else I could do. I just had to let God fight for me because anything I said was a lie. The people that knew who I was were the students because we came from our school to another, the teaching hospital, so they knew me, that they knew I couldn't do it. But we were not dealing with the students, we were dealing with another hospital. Suddenly there was a loud shout. Very loud shout. The person shouted so loud, everybody rushed to that bed. Every student nurse rushed to that bed. The matrons, you know, that's what we call them back home. They wear skirt and blouse. Everybody rushed. The CNOs, the PNOs, one number two, everybody rushed. The bed was crowded. And the nurse said, this is another dressing packet. I just opened it and it is not complete. So, Jane did not steal any first. And he did it in a way that I was not the one that needed to spread the news. The phone calls that are coming in, they started calling them back. I'm telling the autoclave, the lady at the autoclave was the person that the devil used that day. Because she said, this, since I took power in this autoclave department, things have changed in this teaching hospital. We don't know, because he was so proud of her, but she was ruining my future. When he shouted and everybody rushed, and he said, this is another incomplete packet from the autoclave. Please let this student not alone. She did not steal any faucets. Help. I said, God, how I wish you answer every prayer like this. Fast, like fast. And then I had series of people coming to apologize to me. Telling me that my job is already guaranteed, if immediately I graduate if I come and apply, which I wasn't interested. I don't know what you will accuse me again of. <laughs> and it was a series and series of things that happened. And that experience makes me to tell you today that as a Christian, there may be some times that you will be misrepresented. Oh God. So represented with conviction when you know that you are innocent. That is stomaching nonsense. That as a Christian, there are situations you will be outrightly misunderstood. That is stomaching nonsense. 
And when I started thinking about it, I started relating to Jesus, what he went through. He stomached a lot of nonsense. And if we are really striving to be perfect and to be like Jesus, then we have to learn to stomach nonsense. It's a very interesting topic that I borrowed from Dr. Dave Nyekwere's book. And the first time I, con I used it to conduct a Bible study in School of Nursing, I didn't know until a few weeks ago that people still remember that topic. And I used it to compose a song that I quickly composed in a few seconds. And I taught it to the whole church. And a few weeks ago, one of my friends texted the song to me. I said, do you remember this song? I said, I remember it completely, but you missed a few of the lyrics. <laughs> and I'm going to sing that song again, just once, but I'll teach it to you later. And it goes like this. You got a stomach nonsense that the Lord be glorified. You got a stomach nonsense to live in love. There's bound to be conflicts, misunderstandings. You got a stomach nonsense to live in love. You got a stomach nonsense. That the Lord be glorified. You got a stomach nonsense to live in love. There's bound to be conflicts, misunderstandings. You got a stomach nonsense to live in love. Let me see you one more time. Maybe you hum it with me. You got a stomach nonsense. That the Lord be glorified. You got a stomach nonsense to live in love. There's bound to be conflicts, misunderstandings. You got a stomach nonsense to live in love. Voda, let me change my mind. Voda, you got a stomach nonsense. That the Lord be glorified. You got a stomach nonsense to live in love. There's bound to be conflicts, misunderstandings. You got a stomach nonsense to live in love. You need three things to stomach nonsense. The very first thing you need is to realize that you cannot do it. By the time you realize that your strength is nothing, then you receive the power to be able to endure things and stomach things that you thought you couldn't. The power comes on you. And when God bestows upon that upon you that power, you'll be surprised at the heights He's taking you to. I have shared a story here before about when I saw a small snake when I was in high school, and I said, I can kill this one. And I quickly speak a small stick, as small as the snake, to kill the snake. And I was like, hey, die. And the snake jumped to my face. And I froze. You know what they mean, freeze? I froze with the stick that I was going to use to commit murder. <laughs> and fear gripped me because I was imagining if the snake was to bite me here. You know, in Adventist youth society, we have been told if a snake bites you here, you die here. I said, if this snake bites me here. <laughs> <laughs> we are going to <laughs> so I froze and I was just I couldn't I was like what's the next thing going to happen? 
when I finally regained my strength and opened my eyes, I saw that the snake was as terrified as I was and was already on his way out, running for his dear life. That is what happens to you when you underrate your power. You think you can do it. Until when you meet temptation. Until when you meet things that is crushing your ego. And say, no, I can't take this nonsense. You can take it. You can take it. Because the Bible says, be ye therefore perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. You can stomach it. It doesn't change who you are. It helps you to grow. And when God sees that you have stomached that one, I don't know why God does that. He brings on a bigger one. And the other day was like, God, you know this time I endured, and like I endured it this time, I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> I don't want this. But what happened to Jesus Christ? The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He was spat on. He was beaten. He went through what none of us here can go through. Apart from the physical abuse, the humiliation. Jesus stomached nonsense for us. So the first thing you need to be able to stomach nonsense as a Christian is to realize your helplessness and your inability to be righteous. And that is why you have to cry and say, Lord, help me. Simple prayer. Help me. Help me because I cannot do this on my own. Realizing your inability to be righteous is the first step. And when you realize your inability to be righteous and pray for strength, God is going to give you humility. Because many a time, what keeps us from stomaching nonsense, from our children, from our spouse, from our co-worker, from anybody, is pride. Ego. Like, I, I can't. I can't let. No. But when God gives you the humility, you'll be surprised at how much big and how big your stomach is for the nonsense. <laughs> because they will keep going there. Humility. Humility. Humility is what will keep from acting the way you would have ordinarily acted if you did not have the Holy Spirit. Humility is what will keep you from being rash and asking, do I really have to do this? Humility is what will remind you of your worth in Jesus Christ that you do not need to prove to a human being because you know your worth. Humility is what will keep you from reacting because you want to please the Lord. The only reason why Christians stomach nonsense is to glorify God. Because some people know what to do. Some people know what to do. I know some Christian fighters that when they give you a blow, you will end up in ICU. <laughs> If I here, I will rush you fast and send you guys. But why don't they do it? Because they have decided to stomach nonsense. Why they don't take certain actions? Why they don't, don't, they don't act so rashly? Because they have realized that they cannot do it. And when they realize that God gives them the humility, then, from their humility, they go into total dependence on God. The Lord, I surrender all aspects 
of my life to you. Because when you're completely in control, I would not just stomach nonsense. I would also try to avoid people stomaching my nonsense. Because you would know how it feels to stomach nonsense. And so when you go into total dependence, you be careful of how you relate to others. Because you know how it feels. You've been there. And if you're trying to be perfect, as Matthew 5 verse 48 tells us, then you try to make the world a better place. As you go today, I pray that you realize that it's not possible to stomach nonsense as a Christian with your power. Because you cannot. You need the power of the Holy Ghost. And that will help you to be humble. And that will lead you into total dependence. Let us take that chorus once more as I round up this summer. You got a stomach nonsense for the Lord we glorify. You got a stomach nonsense to live in love. There's bound to be complete misunderstanding. You got a stomach nonsense to live in love. One more time. Hello. You got a stomach nonsense that the Lord be glorified. You got a stomach nonsense to live in love. There's bound to be conflicts, misunderstanding. You got a stomach nonsense to live in love.